Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name's Nicole, and I'm an alcoholic. And it's uh, lovely to be here. I'm uh, just going to go back to gallery view. There we have it. Um, lovely to be here, um, even though, as I was saying before, it's um, just gone 5 a.m. on a Sunday morning in Sydney, um, Australia, which, if you can't tell from my accent, is where I'm from. And um, and that just brings um, a whole new meaning to are you willing to go to any lengths to get, to get this? <laughs> I've got to tell you, oh, my gosh, I'm very confused. My dog is very confused. But um, it, but it's all right. We're going to get there. Um, it's really lovely to be here. And um, I'm, I mean, one of the good things about it being 5 a.m. on a Sunday morning is now I'm going to have that happy song for the rest of the day. And that's not a bad song to have in my head for the rest of the day. You guys are just going to go to sleep. I, who knows what you'll wake up with. But me, I've got the whole day of that song. And thank you for picking that song. Um, I am a genuinely happy person today, you know, and that is... Um, due to um, people like you coming to meetings like this um, and um, showing, shining the light for me. And I needed that. I needed that when I came in here. Imagine walking into an AA meeting and having nobody there. (laughs) That would kind of be freaky. We all need to keep coming back to these meetings. If we're, if we're doing our primary purpose, we need to keep coming back to these meetings. And, and it was wonderful to see AA jump onto that so quickly um, over COVID and bring Zoom into our lives and it's been um it's been something that I've loved doing just like even just 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 for this you know to see so many people come from so many places and to see some of my sober sisters hi um and um and for me to be able to get to see my sponsor I am sponsored um and she lives in LA she, she her name is Sharon C and she's part of the Pacific group and Zoom has brought me into a whole different world with her and with my sober sisters and it's just been amazing my home group is the Vaucluse Recovery Group that meets on a Tuesday night um, and at 7 p.m. It's a hybrid group, but it's um, Zoom, non-participatory Zoom at the moment. Here in Sydney, we're really trying to get people back to face-to-face. And um, I love going back to face-to-face. There's something about just um, getting that touch. You know, my sponsor says when there are no more words, reach your hand out and touch somebody on the arm. And, and I love that I get to do that in a face-to-face meeting now. Um, and uh, uh, my sobriety date is the 29th of March, 2001, um, unbroken despite my very best efforts of doing absolutely everything my way for a few years. Um, and hopefully we'll get to that. And, I'm, I, you know, I've, I've got all my books open here to speak on 10 and 11. Um, they are at the moment my favourite steps. I go through phases. I went through a very big step seven phase, um, which lasted a couple of years, and I was really happy for that. But I'm really in a 10 and 11, and I always know when it is because this is the third meeting I've been asked to speak on, on steps 10 and 11. And it's really, I really get it that my higher power is going, you've got things to learn still, woman. Don't think you know everything. Um, and um, I definitely don't know everything. I will preface, though, that anything that I speak to you about today is only what I have learned here in AA. You know, anything that I speak to you about how the disease presents itself in, in Nicole is what I learned here in AA. When I walked into AA, I knew nothing. The only thing I knew when I came here was that I couldn't drink anymore. I, that that was it. I didn't know anything else. I didn't know what AA was going to bring to me. I didn't. And, and actually... If you told me it was going to bring me love and connection and a whole lot of people like you, I probably walked, would have walked out the door. All I knew was that I needed to stop drinking. And I was really, really, really blessed to have seen people 12 years beforehand show me that AA did that for them. It, I was The seed was planted for me uh, 12 years before. But um, I'm loving 10 and 11. I, my service, I've got a service sister, Tina A, and I heard her speak in a meeting not recently, and she says that 10 and 11 are the pipeline to the power. And um, I wish I could say that with an American accent because it sounds so much better with an American accent, but it, she, it's true, a pipeline to the power. And um, and I've had to learn that. I've actually, you know, I've, I, 
I've had to learn things the hard way. I really have had to learn things the hard way, but it's kind of my go, you know, it's, 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 it's my jam. Nicole learns things the hard way and not everything changes when you get sober. <laughs> um, but I, I'll, I'll go into a little bit, you know, um, I want to, um, uh, congratulations to the milestones of people on here. I know people have come in here since I started talking. Um, and um, so if there are any newcomers and hi, James, I'm glad you're back. Um, stay with us. <laughs> um, and um, anybody else who's come in that is new or, or coming back in after experiencing um, life without AA for a little while, I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad you're here. I hope that there's just one person on this meeting that goes, um, here's the language of the heart today. Just one person, you know, just one person wants to go back to one more meeting and stay sober for one more day. Then, then, you know, I'm, I've done God's work, not God's job. And I had to learn the differences between those for a little while. Sponsorship was really good at, at teaching me about um, the difference between God's job and God's work. Um, I do God's work today the best of my ability. Yeah. You know, when I picked up a drink, I drank like a drunk. <laughs> it was as if someone had sat me down in front of a videotape and said, videotape, there's my age. Um, you know, sat, sat me down in front of a TV and said, watch this, watch this and learn how to drink Nicole. I drank like a drunk. Um, you know, I, I, what I've learned about myself is that um, I had a problem before I picked up a drink and it was a problem I didn't know I had and drink was a solution I didn't know I needed. That's, a, that's really what happened for me. Drink was the solution I didn't know I needed. I wanted, I was at A and I wanted to get to Z and I wanted to ignore LMNOP. <laughs> I did not want the middle part of whatever that fluffy stuff that people have when they get on their third drink and feel okay. I wanted to get to see. I needed to get to oblivion. I needed to not feel. Because me without a drink and me without a drink today and without a program, it's the same person. I feel like I don't fit in anywhere. If I haven't got a program, I feel like I don't fit in AA even. Even with all your love, even with all your heart, even with all your stay with us, we love you, Nicole. If I'm not working a program, I don't fit even in AA. And I sure as hell didn't fit anywhere in my life, you know. My darling sponsor talks about lying in the cornfields of Iowa and looking up and waiting for the spaceship man. Not that wasn't me. We didn't have cornfields in Canberra. What I was, I'm sitting in the back of my parents' car and they're driving me somewhere and I'm fantasizing that they're taking me back to my real family, finally. That is what, that is the narrative in my core. That is what my disease presents. It isolates me from anything that loves me. I don't fit in here. I don't fit in this party. I don't fit in this club. I don't fit in this group. I don't fit in this home. And, um, and alcohol, when I got it down and I got it down real fast and real quick because that's how I drank real fast and real quick. I drank like any normal teenager and stopped, did not stop drinking like a teenager for 21 years. Um, and it got me, it got me to not caring. I didn't care that I didn't fit anymore. And, you know, there were maybe moments where I felt like I looked like El McPherson and danced like Madonna and wrote poetry like Dorothy Parker. I mean, fleeting moments of feeling that way, none of which are true, clearly. Um, but, um, but really, I didn't care about that. Really, I just wanted to get to this space of oblivion. I sought oblivion from the get go, and um, and I like and I like that um, that, that that idea that you know um, there are three phases of our drinking: the fun phase, the problematic phase, the fun and uh, the fun and problematic phase, and the problematic phase. I came in on the fun and problematic that phase, fun for me, problematic for absolutely every single person around me. That's the, I, I joined, I came in on there. I didn't ever have a social drink. I never had a drink. I never sat around and. Sorry, um, you got muted there. Sorry, Nicole. That's okay. Am I okay now? Yeah, that's good. Thank you. God, don't tell me. Was it like the last five minutes? No, I'm not going to go back there. Oh, my God, I can't tell you how often that happens to me. Um, no, it's only a second or two. <laughs> okay, good. 
Um, you know, I don't understand. I don't, to this day, I don't. I mean, I still get confused. I mean, I don't have judgment, although my my 18-year-old daughter tells me I have a bit of judgment around drinking. I try not to, but I don't understand the idea of just having a glass of wine with a meal. You know, I don't get it. I don't get it at my core, thankfully. I hope I never get it. I hope I never want to try that um, because I never drank successfully. And um, I ended up, you know, um, I ended up, I ended up a very lonely, um, very, very sad, um, incredibly disconnected um, and um, isolated. My drinking, I'm a boundary rider. I am a boundary rider and um, I am a boundary rider naturally and my drinking took me even beyond that wall. Um, and um, I, drank, I drank with drugs. Um, I drank when... The person over the road, I noticed somebody over the road was having a cry. I had no idea who they were. I'd come inside and I'd drink. I learned very quickly that I couldn't drink, you know, at lunch, you know, like at a job. If I got a job, I usually worked in bars, go figure. Um, but, if, you know, late in my, you know, last sort of six years of my drinking, I finally sort of got jobs. I stopped drinking at 36 years of age and, um and I learned really quickly that having a, um, if going out to lunch with, you know, everybody from work and having a glass of wine, I would come back and I would, and I still remember this feeling, my whole body would be dying to get another drink into me. It was just, I really understand the physical um, side of, of this disease. I really, really get it. And my head, my head telling me I need another drink. I'd wake up and I was never going to drink again after the night before, never going to drink again for the first three hours of the day. Nicole was never going to drink again. And by lunchtime, I was starting to think about how I was just going to go home and have a quiet night and I'll just cook myself some well, there's the bolognese again. I wasn't very kind of varied in my anything. Um, and I just have a glass of wine and I'd get my bottle and I drank red wine and I drank scotch. And I particularly liked scotch because scotch got me to where I needed to go real quick. And I drank scotch with one ice cube because I thought that made me look classy as I fell off stools all around the world. And, um, and it was a tough drink and a hard drink and I smell it now and it smells like petrol. I don't know how I did it, but I did it and I did it with not much aplomb. And I ended up, you know, in a flat on my own, hiding alcohol from myself, which doesn't work. Anybody thinking that that might be something that they do if they go out, hide alcohol from yourself, hiding it up behind the cornflakes on the highest possible shelf, no, I just went back there pretty quick. And I drove in blackout and I heard Father Tom, and God, it shot me to my core. It was only in the last few years I heard Father Tom speak on this um, recently and um, he said he too drove in a blackout and he said he was willing to kill. And uh, that was me, clearly. If I'm driving in blackout, I'm willing to kill. And I didn't know that at the time. I didn't know anything at the time. I was... Um, I had disconnect from anything, but I was really, really, really fortunate. And this is a really important part of my story. I, um, when I was 24 or so, I came across some people who drank and drugged like me and gee, I loved them. They were fun, 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 fun. Um, I didn't kind of do geographicals. I kind of did friendographicals. That is not a word, but I kind of just went from group to group to group in, 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 in Sydney. Um, and, um, uh, I came across these guys and they drank and drugged like me. I mean, actually, they were wild. And so they started to get after a little while. They started to get clean and sober. And um, and I thought that they needed to <laughs> because they were, you know, they needed to. And so I would go along to them to these meetings because I needed to support them because that's the kind of friend that I was. And I'd sit in front of these meetings, particularly in AA, and I'd hear your stories and I'd walk out thinking that I had a better story than you. I thought your stories were pathetic, frankly. And I did not understand at any level of myself that I was identifying. But the seed of AA was planted. But the even more important part of this story is this 12-step part of this story for me is that 12 years later, um, I rang one of those people. I had seen her two years beforehand. We were meeting at a festival one Sunday. And um, we were meeting, I don't know, at 12 o'clock or something. And I turned up from the night before, still in the clothes of the night before, 
um, shaking with the DTs. I'd lost my, I think we had mobiles then. Anyway, I lost I lost everything. I'd lost my wallet. I'd lost my keys. I had gone home with someone I did not like. I knew I didn't like this person, but I went home with them anyway because drinking, I had slid my dignity over the bar, as my sponsor talks about many years before then. I had slid my self-respect over the bars many years before then. And I saw Karen and I was doing my usual, I would turn up and go, yep, hi, I need to leave in five minutes. The first thing that would come out of my my mouth when I turned up anywhere, didn't family dinners anywhere, was that I had to go. I had to leave in five or 10 minutes. And she said, she watched me walk away and said to our our other friend, I think she's going to die. I don't think I'm going to see her. And two years later, I rang her and I said, are you going to those meetings still? And she said, yes. She said, yes. If she had said no, if she hadn't stayed in these meetings, if she hadn't been working her 10 and 11, this pipeline to the pipeline to the power, if she hadn't been working 10 and 11 where she kept on checking on her defects, if she hadn't been working 10 and 11 and kept landing in God's lap and trying to do better and trying to be elsewhere, I wouldn't be here. You'd have another speaker. I'd be drunk. I'd be dead. Someone else would be dead because of my driving. She looked after herself. She couldn't save me. She couldn't save me until I rang her and said that really important question. I didn't say, can you help me? I said, are you still going to those meetings? And she said, yes. And I was 36 years of age. I had nothing. I had a car that I was just working. I had no job. I had a dog that um, was patient and understanding. And um, I had nothing else. I'd had friends who were saying to me, um, uh, we love you, Nicole, but we can't go out with you anymore. Yesterday, I took myself off to the theatre. I do that. And um, I went and saw a play. It was really beautifully done. It was about Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And it got me thinking about why, um, why Bill put that in our book. Because I absolutely was that. In fact, my friends started calling me drunk, Nicole. They would ring me the next day and say, your evil twin sister was out last night, Nicole. So the drunk Nicole was the evil twin sister. Nicole sober, as uncomfortable and discontent and irritable as I was, sober was nicer than the drunk Nicole, the evil twin sister. But I came to AA and... um, And I started my journey. I started my journey. And it's been the most amazing journey. (laughs) It's been quite a ride so far. Um, I love talking about my sobriety. And it hasn't all been, um, you know, lollipops and, you know, hymns and roses and, and joy. It's There's been a lot of pain in my sobriety too. And I don't even know how I've done it, but I haven't had to pick up a drink. Mind you, I've had to pick up a lot of other things without a program, Uh, a lot of other things. I have met parts of me that I didn't actually, frankly, want to meet. Um, I've met character defects that bubble underneath me, um, that without steps, particularly 10 and 11, I'm in a lot of trouble. But who's in trouble before me is everybody around me, the people that I love, because I've learned how to love in AA. More than that, I've learned how to receive it. Like, put your hand up if you came in here not knowing how to receive love. Me, all over the place, I did not know how to see, feel the love that you tried to give me. I didn't know. I didn't know what to do with it, and I didn't know how to return it. I had no self-esteem, and yet some crazy ego. It's such a volatile mix, that. But I came in and I was 36 years of age and I had decided um, I had decided that um, I um, um, that I had missed out on a lot of life. I was really cross that I hadn't got it, you know, 12 years beforehand. I was very happy. My friends were still sober. Of course, I was. They got me to my meeting. So I started. I got into this like I, I I actually got into AA the exact same way. I, I got into my drinking, like I'm an all or nothing 
all or nothing person, right? I have a sponsee that, you know, I'm really privileged to sponsor women. I don't think they're on this meeting today. If anybody got up at five o'clock on a, on a Sunday morning, any of my sponsees, bar one, hi, Mel. <laughs> but um, if any of the others did who live in Sydney, they'd be getting a gold star. But um, I'm, I, 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 I'm very privileged to sponsor some people. I don't, oh, yes, and I, have, I sponsor one, and she's, she lives in Australia, but she's Texan, and she calls me her ride-or-die sponsor, and I love that. And I am a bit of a ride-or-die girl here in AA. I really am. I'm, 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 I'm all in it, and I just went for it. I went for it long and hard. So by the time I was three years sober, I was doing service all over the place. I joined, you know, as many groups as I could until I started going to group consciences. And then I dropped it back down to one because, oh my God. Um, but I did all sorts. I did service. I had my first sponsor, Jody, was big in service. I was on, you know, conference committees. We don't have a lot here in, in Australia, but we do have a few. And I was on the AA hotline. I was I, writing articles, um, for our little magazine, the reviver and, um, I was trying to sponsor people, but I was really the stepping stone sponsor, you know, for the first sort of three to five years of my life, I was sponsoring people one, two and three, and then they'd find their real sponsor and go off and do other stuff. But it's okay. I didn't care. I was picking people up and taking them to meetings and I was absolutely loving everything about AA and everything about my life. I really was. I had no problem with God except for the word. So I called God Bruce for the first two years of my sobriety because, you know, Bruce was better than God. And that was okay. It worked for me. Don't worry about that. My relationship with God has just, it's just been like me and varying degrees of a 180 degree turn, right? And my sponsor's um, husband, who's now passed, talks about that, that 100, the varying degrees of the 180. My relationship with God has been on that as well. And it has continued to grow. And oh my God, I just pray for you that your relationship with God continues to grow. It has been one of the most amazing relationships that I that has ever been presented to me that I didn't know I needed. I mean, I thought people who needed, I thought here's two things. I thought people who met in cafes and people who went to church and needed God work weak and pathetic and I tell you after this I'm off to go and get my almond chai latte from the cafe across the road and I talk about God all the time all the time so by the time I'm three years sober I'm pregnant <laughs> of course I am I've known this guy for a, a month of course I have um, because some things don't change and um, and I get pregnant but I'm 38 and I'm keeping 39 and I'm keeping this baby and um, she's just turned 18 and she's never seen me drunk she's seen me insane and we'll get there but she's never seen me drunk and um, by the time I'm five years old I'm a single mum or four, no five years old five years sober four years four year five years sober I'm a single mum. And I'm learning what it is to have to get rid of all of those um, commitments and that service. And I had a friend here, Judge Jimmy, um, who's no longer with us, he's in the meeting in the sky. And he said, God would need you to be a mum right now. You'll circle back. And I needed to hear those words because I needed to be a single mum. And then I'm in a new relationship real quick because <laughs> that's what I'm like. And um, I've got two stepchildren, 11 and 13. And by the time I'm nine years sober, his, my partner's sister died and she had an eight-year-old and I'm all of a sudden mothering an eight-year-old. And here's what I did. I started to boundary ride. I loved AA. I did not turn my back on you. I did not turn my back on God, but I just started to say, I've got this God. I've got this God. Don't worry. You look after Sandy Beach talks about this. I share about this all the time and I cannot paraphrase Sandy Beach. I mean, if you can paraphrase Sandy Beach, you're in luck, right? I can't. And, um, but he talks about this in, in American states that he'll keep Texas, but you know, God can keep Texas, but he can, he'll just start taking all these other states back. And that's what I did. And by the time I'm 16 years sober, I'm in so much pain. I don't even know where to look. I have rested on my laurels in step 10 and 11 without a doubt. Bill wrote in step 10, he wrote it and he wrote it for a reason. It is easy to let up, let up on the spiritual program of action and rest on our laurels. And I absolutely did. I rested on my laurels in 10 and 11. Now, I would talk to God throughout the day. Yep, God, 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 hi, hi, hi. Please don't let me drink today. But oh, I know how to be a stepmom. I know how to be a worker. I know how to be a partner. I know how to be a mother. I know how to be a dog owner of two rescue dogs who are insane. I know. I know all of this stuff. Just let me add it, God. 
And by the time I'm 16 years sober, I'm in so much pain and I take myself, I finally get myself to a conference and I meet my, my sponsor, Sharon, who is my sponsor today, and she's speaking on 10 and 11. She's speaking on 10 and 11. And I go up to her and I'm, I'm sitting there. Um, my, my second AA meeting, I take a friend of mine who's not an alcoholic, but she's one of my hostages. I don't know if you had any hostages. I had a few hostages that would, I, some for some reason, they would stay out all night with me. And Susan was one of them. And so I took her to this AA meeting and we're sitting down the back. It's the only time I've really ever sat down the back. And we're sitting down the back and you people are standing up and you're sharing your stories and your beautiful strength and hope and your message and your love. Um, and, and every time you sit down, she elbows me in the ribs, says, you drink like this, Nicole. And I'm going, yeah, no, I get it. I get it. I'm my second AME. I know everything. Every time someone sat down, she'd elbow me in the ribs saying, you, these are your people. It was like God with skin on. My, my sponsor talks about God with skin on. She was Bruce with skin on right there, that moment, this redhead, this friend of mine who'd known me all my life, who started to tell me she didn't want to see me go out with me anymore. She just wanted to see me in cafes during the day. She's elbowing me in the ribs, making sure I did not miss this this time. Because if you remember 12 years ago, I thought your stories were pathetic, but I didn't miss it. But here I am sitting in this conference and Sharon sharing her story on 10 and 11. And I've got my one sponsee. <laughs> I have one sponsee. I'm going to a meeting a month. I'm completely insane. I got this sponsee not through AA because I wasn't going to enough AA. I got it through a shared therapist. One sponsee, and she is elbowing me in the ribs. Here we are again, God with skin on, saying, here's your sponsor. I'm going, yeah, I think you might be right. I think you might be right. And I stand in the receiving line. There's 300 people and I've got 300 resentments by the time I get to Sharon because they're all just talking to her too long. And I've decided in my head that they've all asked her to be her, this, their sponsor and she's going to get to me and say, my card's full, like it's some kind of dance. Um, but I get to her and I like to say I got on my knees. Apparently I didn't, but I like to say that I got on my knees and I asked her to be that I, that I was looking for a, a sponsor whose voice was the loudest one in my head because the loudest one in my head right now was insane. I was insane. And she said, yes, okay, let's go. Let's see how we go. And, um, you know, it's a funny story. I wrote her the 15. And she said, right, go home, write me an email about you. I want to know about you. And I know Sharon, she really wanted to know about me. That She wasn't just saying that. She, she's just got this special thing. She wanted to know about me. So I wrote her a 15-page email. <laughs> she got the lot. And um, and she didn't reply for about three weeks. I started to hear myself say, Aki, you don't need a sponsor. I've been saying, I've been sponsoring myself for three years. And I, I've been saying that to myself for a long time. You don't need her. And uh, finally, someone said, why don't you resend the email, which was, you know, music to my ears. I don't know why I hadn't thought that. Um, and she replied and all sorts of things had happened. And we started our journey. And she said to me, we're going to work 10, 11 and 12. And I love to say this. And I shared it just on a meeting yesterday that I sort of thought to myself, well, I'll work 10 and 11. and You're working 12 because I ain't going near anything like 12. Like there was nothing left of me. And, um, and I started working 10 and 11 with Sharon. And that started, and I started to look at it. I started to look at 10. I started to read these words like, that is the emotional hangover, the direct result of yesterday and sometimes today, excesses of negative emotion, anger, fear, jealousy, and the like. I was full of that. I had had no recourse for that. I had spent years of just, you know, when I first came into AA, I heard this fantastic story of um, how when we're drinking, and it really shows my age. When we're drinking, we're driving along with a panel van. But one of those 1970s panel vans, you could put a mattress in the back for all the naughty stuff. And we're drinking. And every time something comes up, any time, a problem, joy, a resentment. I mean, I didn't know what a resentment was when I was drinking anyway. Anything, you just throw in the back of the panel van and keep driving. Throw in the back of the panel van. And when you get sober, you throw your foot onto the brake and everything comes and lands on your lap. And the steps are sorting through all of that. Well, I had that exact same experience, but in AA. I've had two rock bottoms. The first one, 21 years ago, and the second one, five and a half, six years ago. And if you ask me which one I'd have again, I'd have the first one 21 years ago, as scary as that sounds. But when you have a rock bottom with AA in your heart and only you in your head, it is the most incredibly painful thing. 
it is the most incredibly painful space to be in. And that's where I was. And I wasn't doing step 10. And I wasn't doing spot check inventories. I'd done a four. Absolutely. I was fearless and I was moral and I was everything. And I got in there, but I didn't do a 10. My 10 just consisted of, hey, God, I'm here. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm just doing it anyway and move on over. You know, if God and I are on a tandem bike, I put him on the back and I was going over all of the rocks. And um, so when when Sharon and I, you know, when Sharon and I started working together, you know, I um, before it says on page 84, it says here, and we've ceased fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol. And I'd stop fighting alcohol. In all of, in all of that madness and that barren land that I was in before, uh, at you know, twelve to sixteen years of sobriety, I never, I never thought of alcohol. It was never. I, I, I knew in my core that that's not where I went. But I had picked up every single other defect. I had picked up perfectionism. I had picked up people pleasing. I mean, people pleasing is just another word for self seeking. I had picked up self seeking to the nth degree. I had picked up resentment. I had picked up judgment and intolerance and and impatience. I had picked up all of these things and had nowhere to let them go, which is what 10 is. We get in here, right? We get in here and we do one through to nine absolutely vigorously. And if we get halfway through nine, we start getting the promises. And that had occurred to me. I started getting those promises halfway through nine. And Bill never leaves us, you know. We do four and five and and we don't go straight to eight. There's six and seven. I told you I've already been an addict in seven. I love step seven. And I bring step seven into 10. Today I'll do a spot check inventory and I use the spiritual toolkit. Something will come up, you know, big things, big things. My, I've just, at the beginning of this year, a 16, my 16 year relationship, that relationship that I got into at five years um, ended and it ended mutually. Um, but that's not to say that there wasn't a resentment or a judgment or intolerance in that, you know. My step 10, I've got to go into that space. I have got to dive into step 10 and I use the spiritual toolkit and I stop. I pause somewhere and that's a plus. Nicole pausing is a plus. And I get it out and I start writing it. And now if you if you pay for premium, which is $14 for a year, so like, Let's pay for it. Um, it gives you four tabs, which I didn't know about. So you've got a resentment one, a fear one, a harm one, and a sex one. Oh, my God, did I use that fear and sex one like that was going out of fashion. But it gives you these tabs, and you get through it, and you get to the end, and you find out what defects been bubbling there, that self-seeking, that perfectionism, that intolerance, that judgment of others. If only he had done this, if only this, you know. I, I, I go up and get my chai in the morning, right? I'm a cafe loving chai drinking person now, but who knew? And um, sometimes she will, if, and I'll go up for the second one in the afternoon. And surely people have more than one coffee. Anyway, she often says, and I, I know she's just saying it to be nice, but she often says, oh, your second one. And I just have, I have to put her on a step 10 because I feel so judged by her. I just, my head would just goes into this madness. So from the most incredibly stupid, facile things like that to quite an intense ones where I really thought my partner could have done different differently to save the relationship I go to step 10 for because what's really important is that I need to see what's driving me I need to see what it is that is presenting itself in me because I don't know half the tools that I pick up they feel really nice in my hand they're tools that I learned as a kid when I'm sitting in the back of the car wishing I was going to my real family they're tools that I learned and just waved around I'm not conscious of them step 10 brings me into a consciousness of them these tools these things that probably saved me as a kid frankly I'm not saying they're bad things I'm just saying today they don't serve me and if I don't do a step 10, I don't know that they're not serving me. I just do them without thought. I do them without mindfulness. But here's what I do after a 10, because I've got some information from a step 10. I've got some information about me. It's different information all the time. You're being intolerant in this, in this moment. You're full of fear, Nicole. You've got some impatience going on. How's that judgment from your, your position in the world, Nicole? 
I've got to do a seven because that's the step that Bill gave us after doing a four and five with somebody, right? We've landed in, in five and our sponsor, if we, you know, we've got a sponsor who wants more for us than we want for ourselves is going to add to that fourth column, be that sponsor, add to that fourth column, help that person out, right? And we've got that fourth column of all of this information and Bill gives us six and seven. We get six and seven. Seven is go to God with that. God's the solution, right? God's the solution to all my problems. I've learned that the hard way. I've learned that by being in barren AA land. I've learned that by going into it's really uncomfortable when I go into my defects of character now. I can feel it now. I know that I'm in it because it feels like a prickly mohair jumper, right? It feels like I'm sitting on something uncomfortable. So I go to seven after 10. And if I'm getting a 10 from my sponsees, I, I go back to them and I say, you take this to God now. You take this fear to God. You take this judgment to God. You do a step seven after a 10. And 10 got me some freedom. Now, since I've been with Sharon, I've done three step fours because there was a lot of stuff in the panel van, right? There was a lot of stuff. I had to get rid of all of that kind of stuff. And then we really had some things that were packed in there, nicely packed down. It's like similar to Sandy Beach's backpack, right? You know? And I'll use that now because step 11 is that for me. But I'm doing enough step 10s and I'm getting rid of all of those uh, defects that I kind of just pick up really easy and I get into some tap root stuff. Some stuff maybe that I didn't get into in my first four and certainly stuff that I didn't look at when I was just really busy in AA and busy in my life with my daughter and my grand, my um, stepchildren and my and Annabelle. Um, busy with all the stuff that I knew how to do. Um, and so step 10 brought me to a few step fours. And I did those and I did those willing, willingly. Um, you know, I started at the beginning of this meeting saying that, you know, when I was asked to share today and I realized it was 5 a.m. on a Sunday, the time and it brought a whole new meaning to um are we willing to go to any lengths you know it struck me and it strikes me all the time I work in a rehab and I ask that question a bit but um it's not a question you just ask a newcomer or ask someone you're about to sponsor I've had to ask myself that question quite a few times in sobriety I had to ask that self my that's that question to myself at the beginning of this year when my relationship started to end um and um, and I definitely had to ask myself that question when I started working this program with Sharon. Step 10 is a step I utilize on a daily basis along with step seven. I absolutely love it. It gives me a chance to pause. It gives me a chance to breathe. It gives me a chance to say sorry today, now, rather than the next day or down by a week when I maybe, you know, oh, I need to run by something by you, Sharon, you know, and it's oh, been a few weeks. It gives me a chance to be God reliant i'm not person reliant anymore i'm not sponsor reliant anymore i'm definitely not nicole reliant anymore i'm god reliant to the best of my ability and step 10 gets me there it gets me there because i'll send a send step 10 off to sharon and i won't get her i won't get a response sometimes i don't recite i only respond to my sponsees i've got a few i mean god gives the sickest of us the most sponsees that's what i reckon and i've got a few because i'm pretty sick um, but I'll only respond if I think that they've missed something, you know, because I want them to be God reliant and God's in them. The voice of God is in them. And I'm just, I want them to give that voice the megaphone and you get it through step 10. You know, the only time that I didn't, hi baby, my dog is getting very um, needy. Um, she does this when I share, when I particularly want to get a bit emotional, she starts needing me to pat her. <laughs> um, she's a God dog. Um, the only time I had any more than three days off drinking in 21 years in my whole sobriety was when I took myself off at 21 years of age to Vipassana, which is a silent meditation where you don't speak or look anybody in the eye for 10 years, uh, 10 years, 10 days. It felt like 10 years. Um, um, I was insane when I came out of there. The first thing I did was take a drink. If you can, um, if that surprises you, or you haven't been listening to my story. Um, but I learned some stuff. I learned some stuff. 
And so when I came, um, when I got to step um, 11 and I saw prayer and meditation, I, I wasn't too keen on the prayer bit. <laughs> um, the serenity prayer was the first prayer I trusted, was the first prayer I trusted. And I said it over and over and over again. I said it before I went into court from, you know, wreckage of my past. I, 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 I at, at 16, 17 years sober with a 14, 15 year old daughter, she was in being inserted into the serenity prayer. Her name only was being inserted into the serenity prayer. It was the first prayer I trusted, but meditation, eh, I could do. I knew how to meditate and, um, I didn't. Um, I certainly knew how to sit um, and I started to meditate. And I and I love this step. I love 11. I love 11 in the morning and I love 11 at the night. Now, I, I rested on my laurels in 11 as well. Absolutely, I did. I was doing more 10. I mean, I was trying to do step 10 in my barren days, but the thing was I didn't have a sponsor. <laughs> so I was sponsoring myself with step 10. And I don't know about you, but I am a rationalite. I know how to rationalize myself out of anything. And I know how to justify myself out of anything. And I certainly wasn't getting any of that thinking checked by anyone. So I was doing step 10 and doing it to myself. Uh, don't advise that. You're going down a wrong path with that. But step 11, I wasn't doing at all. And here's what I use. I'll talk about step 11 at night. I say to my sponsees, if you've done a step 10 with me um, during the day, it's imperative that you do an 11. It's absolutely imperative. I've got 15 minutes. It's absolutely imperative that you do an 11. Because if, if we go into, we go from the panel van and we go into the backpack that um, is Sandy Beach will talk about. So my resentments and my to intolerance and impatience are as like dual rocks and pebbles and stones that I pop in the back of my backpack and wear all during the day. And when I do a 10, I take it out. There's the child lady's stone. I'm not going to carry. I mean, sh I, I learned that it's just my, 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 my self-seeking, my needing her to not question my chai drinking for me to feel better. I take it out of the backpack with step 10. When I get home that night, and often when I'm doing a 10, sorry, I keep going back and forth, but they're so intertwined, these two. When I'm doing a 10, I'm on, I'm on the run, right? I'm on the hop. I mean, I'm doing it. I'm being God conscious. I'm sending it to my sponsor. I'm exhaling. I'm breathing. I've got pause and exhale tattooed on my, my arms here, right? Like pause and exhale. Like I'm, they're things that Nicole needs to do. Um, but am I sitting in God's lap? Not quite. I'm kind of running with God. Yeah, we've got this and I'm doing that. Step 11 for me, particularly at night, well, actually night in the morning, is that I'm sitting in God's lap, how I like to see it. And, um, and what I'm doing is I'm rattling the backpack to see if there's anything left, right? I'm rattling that backpack to see if there's anything that I've left. Did I actually take that, you know, in judgment of that person or that intolerance or that resentment out? Did I actually really give that to God? Did I go to step seven with that? And that's what that step 11, again, I use the spiritual toolkit. Um, and that's what that step 11 makes me do. But I'm doing it in a different space, right? I'm doing step 11, usually in bed, Um um, usually when the day is over and I've done my teeth and washed my face, um, it's before I've picked up my, a book I like to read to go to sleep. But um, it's I'm in a different headspace. I've probably done a meeting. I've definitely spoken to a sponsee, definitely. I'm in a different headspace and I go to my 11 and I really look at my day, not just that moment, not just the chai lady, right, but I look at my whole day. And in that process, I crawl into God's loving lap and into God's loving arms. And I get really honest with that space and my breathing starts, you know, it's like, um, I love talking to sponsees and newcomers about that exhale you get in an AA meeting. And I hope somebody has got it today about 20 minutes in, right? 20 minutes in all of a sudden, well, there's an exhale. When you're sharing like this, it's, that, that was my exhale. Um, but you just, it's the clinic of calm. That happens to me in 11. I'm writing it down. I'm thinking about my day and I'm, and I'm not going into anything morbid. You know, I'm really thinking about what I've done today. That's been, that's been God aligned. I'm thinking, I'm thinking about that. I'm wanting to be in that space, you know, um, 
In the language of the heart on page 240, Bill writes here, but step 11 can keep us growing, even um, if we try hard and work at it continually. If we expand even 5% of the time on step 11 that we habitually and rightly lavish on step 12, the results can be wonderfully far reaching. That is an almost uniform experience of those who constantly practice step 11. That's, that's absolutely my experience of step 11. By giving me that time at night, my understanding, and I don't understand, but my understanding and my willingness to understand my relationship with God expand every single time. Oh, I've just come off. I Twice a year with my sponsees, I go, let's do a 30 and 30 step 11. So what we all do, and I share my step 11 with my sponsees, by the way. Um, I don't share step 10s with them, um, but I share my step 11 with them. Um, If if there's something that I don't want to, I'll do two step 11s, give one just to Sharon, and I share them. But I, I want them. My sponsor has taught me right from the word go that all I am is an example of AA. All I am is an example of how AA works in my life. That's it. I can't fix anybody. If I'm trying to fix someone, I'm trying to do God's job, not God's work. I am an example of AA. And so by showing my step 11 to people and where I can go crazy during the day or where I maybe not have filled it with beautiful things, I'm showing my sponsees that I'm a drunk just like them. I'm nothing. I'm nothing. I'm not a don't do anything else with me except have me walk alongside you, linking arm and arm. So if ever you fall, um, maybe my spiritual bicep is a little bit fitter after 21 years and I can help pick you up. But that's it. I'm getting picked up by Sharon and all my service sisters this side, right? That's what we work. We just walk arm in arm, side by side. Nobody is a front, nobody is above. And my step 11 reminds me of that. But I'm sitting and I've crawled into God's lap and I'm in that space and I've exhaled and I'm going to have a better sleep. But I'm also going to have a look at the good things that I've done, right? And I'm going to double check if I did, I need to make it. Do I need to say sorry to my chai lady? Did I look at her weird? You know, did I, did I need to, if I have been too busy to sort of work out whether, um, you know, in my running in my step 10, whether I need to, you know, say sorry somewhere. And more often than not now, no, you know, more often today I say sorry exactly when I need to, you know. Um, And I pray. And I pray. I thank God at the end of that nightly one. I thank God that I'm sober, that it's nine o'clock. I'm going to have a nana nap today too, I can tell you right here and right now. It's Father's Day today. We're going off for dinner tonight. My dad died in 2020 and I miss him terribly and we're all having dinner for him tonight. So there'll definitely be a nana nap this afternoon after a 5 a.m., 4 a.m. start. But um, And I pray and I pray at the end of 11. And I did a lot of meditation without prayer for a while. I told you, I, I don't know about prayer. I didn't trust it. I didn't trust prayer. I trusted the serenity prayer and I didn't trust any any other. But in my morning when I do a step 11, I, I, I meditate now. When I started working with Sharon, she got me back to meditation and we got to, I use Insight Timer for meditation and I did two minutes. I started with two minutes, two minutes. That's all I could do. And I would say the third step prayer after those two minutes. I now do 20 to 20 minutes. That's usually the timing that I quite like, maybe 25. At the end of my meditation and, you know, I want to quickly talk about meditation. I got a little bit of time about it. Um, you know, meditation is is another is another kind of it's like a bicep curl. Uh, the, meditation is not about having sitting for twenty minutes and not having thought. From my in my experience, like Astrid H says, you know, this is my fifty minutes. I, I get to I get to talk about my opinion. Um, m- my opinion of meditation is that. Um, it's about the process of bringing my breath back, my, my mind back to my breath. And I really like that. I like that idea because that's what my day is, is the process of bringing myself back to God. Like I don't stay with God just because I do 10 and 11, just because I do a three and a seven, just because I sponsor people, just because I have a sponsor and go away. It doesn't mean that I wake up in the morning, say, hey, God, I'm with you and stay with God all day. Oh, my God. Wouldn't that be amazing if I stay with God all day? No, I don't stay with God all day. I have to bring myself back to God all day. And meditation is that I bring my mind back to my breath 
for that 20 minutes. I don't, I, my mind comes back to my breath and I'm on my breath and then my mind goes off again because that's what my brain does. It's here to think. I don't want it to stop thinking. I'm not, I don't get angry if it thinks and it goes off and it decides what I'm wearing today because it's the important stuff when it comes to meditation and all who I'm going, what I'm going to say or what I'm going to do, right? And I just bring it back. So meditation for me is the process. And I've had a successful one if I've continued to bring my, my consciousness back to my breath, right? I've had a successful meditation. And at the end of that meditation, I say the third step prayer. That's the second prayer I trusted. That's a powerful prayer. That's a powerful prayer. You're on your third step and Bill's telling you that you're here to help others. In that prayer, he's telling you you're here to help others. Wow, right then, I'm doing the third step when I'm, what, four months sober and I'm getting told I'm here to help others? <laughs> Miss that, but I said it every day. It got in. It got in there. I didn't get sober to help out others. No. But he knew how to do that, and he wrote that prayer to tell us to help others. And then I do my seven-step prayer, my seven-step prayer. I do the seven-step prayer, and I do it from the book. I do the one. But what I tend to sometimes if I know I'm running, so say in the breakup, I was running on some fear and sadness and I was running on judgment because if only, if only he was perfect. And so what I did with that seven step and that seven step prayer, I go and get a bit specific. I add some things. God, can you take my judgment away? And then I add more. I say, and can you replace it, please? Because I need to hear these words in my head in the morning. I need to hear words like tolerance, kindness, you know, compassion. Because they're not words that naturally come into my head. I don't know about you, but they're not words that naturally come into my head. So I say them in the morning. Let's replace, let's replace this stuff that naturally comes up for this alcoholic and replace it for more God conscious and more God aligned things. You know, God's everlasting love. God is an action word. God is a verb. So I'm looking for be compassionate, you know, not do compassion, be compassionate, be kind, be quiet. That's one for me because, you know, I need to, I had to learn how to listen in this program. And I'm still learning, but be loving, you know, be open, be willing. I love bringing, I love expanding my seven step prayer. And then I'm learning the 11 step prayer. And I'm learning it. And the top half is the hardest bit to learn, you know. The bottom one I know, and I love that, you know, uh, you know, I love that, you know, to 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 forgive is to be forgiven. And um, I, I, the St. Francis prayer is a prayer that is my is my blue ribbon goal to to live within if I can. But it's a mighty prayer. But I go to it every day, and I and I aim for it. I aim. I face in its direction. I face, I face to understand than to be understood. I face to comfort than to be comforted. I face to love than be loved because Nicole running Nicole, those things are opposite, right? Love me first, understand me first, right? I try and put connection in before correction with my daughter, you know? Um, I've gone a long way. What have I got? Four minutes I've come a long way when I started first working with Sharon, my daughter had moved out from me. You know, you don't, you don't do four years of barren AA without consequences. And the consequences with my daughter saying, see you later, going with dad. The most painful time of my life. And I drop her off. I go and pick her up from her dad's and we go and do something and I drop her off and she'd be smiling and I'd do this thing pretending that I was happy, wanting her to see that I was happy and I'd beat the horn and we'd wave and I'd go around the corner and I'd stop the car and I'd just cry. I just wanted her back. And I had to accept. And the thing about acceptance, it is the key, but it doesn't say after that and then you will love what you're accepting. No. You just have to accept it. You're not going to like it. You're not going to love it. You just have to accept it. And I did. And I'll never forget the day, a year, maybe 18 months later, I dropped her off one day and I beat the car, beat, beat, beat the horn and waved at her and went around the corner and I kept driving. I didn't stop and cry. I kept driving. I didn't like that she was there. I wanted her back. But I had fully accepted and God was with me. Two years ago, she moved back with me. Be careful what you wish for. Ah! Um, ha! Ha! 
she moved back with me and we have a wonderful relationship today. Well, she's 18 and um, experiencing it all and doing all of that. And I'm learning how to be tolerant and I'm using my seven step prayer and I'm using my 11 step prayer. And I absolutely want to understand her before she needs to understand what I'm trying to say to her. Right. Step 11 in the morning is my absolute go to. I give myself to somebody I heard somebody said I heard somebody say at a retreat, I think that, you know, I, I, I give my morning to God and God gives me the day. And I really love that. And my day is full of sponsee calls and I, I work at a rehab and and I get to see the AA facelift and these people, you know, after a couple of weeks, they come in like this and I just get to see this beautiful facelift that we get here. I rested on my laurels in these steps. I did. It was a really dangerous place for me to be. I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about how what life's like around me when I'm in control. The second part of the first step, my, my life is unmanageable. I know I'm unmanageable when I'm micromanaging. I know I'm unmanageable when I have got my finger in every single pie and the Nicole knows best when I'm not going to God in the mornings. It's been a long time now, you know. I'm pretty proud. At Insight Timer, you get to count your days, and I'm a bit of a day counter, right? And um, I'm way over, way over, I think four years with that. There's not a day that has not passed um, without me doing some meditation. And, um, and that's not a brag. My meditation is all about my mad head coming back to the breath. It's not a brag. It doesn't make me um, smooth and calm, monk-like out in the world, but it just gives me a chance. It gives me a chance. It opens up the channel, right? When I meditate in the morning, I think channel between, I wake up in my head. I wake up in my head. I don't wake up in my heart. Oh, my God, if only I woke up in my heart. I wake up in my head. And so when I meditate, it opens up that channel from my head to my heart. So during the day, I've got a better chance, a better chance of dropping down into my heart. And if I'm down in my heart, then I've got a better chance of the language of the heart being shared between you and I, because I need that. I need the language of my, the heart every single day. I need it in my life. I need you. I need your experience. I need your strength. I need your hope. I need to see you on Zoom. I need to see you at meetings. I need your phone calls because you are all God with skin on for me. I am absolutely overpaid. I'm happy a lot of the time. Happy. You know, it hasn't been an easy eight months. It hasn't. I'm 57 and single. That was not the plan, God. But I'm all right. I had a weekend the other weekend. It was the happiest weekend I've had in such a long time. It included service and gigs and all sorts of things. I have God. I have sobriety. I have you. I'm overpaid. I'm absolutely fulfilled. And it's been a complete joy to share on here tonight. And um, thank you so much. I hope, I hope someone heard and wants to go back to one more meeting. Just one more meeting. <laughs> Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.